During the Depression, many farmers struggled to keep their land from being foreclosed on by the banks and struggled with pricing their food. Growing your own food or having a garden was seen as something that poor people did. Contrast that with the current situation in the U.S. where the overall price of groceries has increased and access to a variety of fresh produce is a luxury. The view towards those in the lower socioeconomic levels can be illustrated by Anton Chekhov's short story Ustritsi, or in English, Oysters. A father who was at one time successful is reduced to begging in the streets with his son to survive. As they cry out for help, a couple of gentlemen decide to make their own amusement by buying a meal for the son. The problem is that they buy him oysters, and since the son has been starving, he is unable to eat the slimy oysters, spitting them out on the plate while the two gentlemen laugh at him. After this exchange, the boys return to the father who assumes his son was able to eat, but he's also angry at himself for not asking for money from the gentleman. The son doesn't tell his father that he wasn't able to eat, and just returns to begging with him. The two men in the story that buy the meal for the son reflect the current conservative wealthy mindset. Their lack of empathy and willful ignorance toward the situation of this father and son show the painful reality that those at the top do not care and don't understand what it's like for the majority of people in this country. It never ends. If you're poor, every decision you make is wrong somehow. If you eat produce but it's not organic, it's bad. If you eat frozen, it's not as good as fresh. If you eat processed food, it's garbage. If we're going to criticize what someone eats and how their finances are affected, we need to discuss why poor people and food will always be a contentious relationship. Feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell, under the watchful eye of Mothra the Bunny of Data Science. Let's do this. Todd, would you like some mixed vegetables? Hell no. <gasps> what did you say? I said I don't want any damn vegetables. All right, that's it, young man. No Bible stories for you tonight. Oh. <laughs> Weren't you a little hard on him? Well, you knew I had a temper when you married me. According to the 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, adults should consume 1.5 to 2 cups of fruit and 2 to 3 cups of vegetables a day, but roughly 1 in 10 adults do not meet this requirement. The Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System of the Centers for Disease Control has been tracking the amount of fruit and vegetables that people consume for at least the last decade. In my video on consumption of sugary beverages and access to water, I discussed that not asking the right questions and not being aware of the lack of access to water means that we're not going to solve the root cause if we're not actually looking at what the true cause is. When it comes to the amount of fruit and veg that the average person eats, it's a similar issue. We're not asking the right questions, which makes it more difficult to fully understand the situation. You see, marriage is a lot like an orange. First, you have the skin, then the sweet, sweet innards. I don't understand. If I wanted to see a man eat an orange, I would have taken the orange eating class. The eating of an orange is a lot like a good marriage. Just eat the damn orange! Food deserts can exist anywhere in the U.S., whether it's urban or rural. They may look a little different, but it means the same thing. An accessibility to affordable, healthy food. Food deserts are tracked by the combined efforts of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Treasury, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Their official definition is, quote, low-income census tracts with substantial number of share of residents with low levels of access to retail outlets selling healthy and affordable foods are defined as food deserts. A census tract is a small, relatively permanent subdivision of a county that usually contains 1,000 to 8,000 people, but generally averages around 4,000 people." End quote. For those in urban areas with a dense population, they are less likely to own a car, so most walk or use public transportation. Areas that have a higher percentage of people of color are more likely to have small stores that are more reflective of convenience stores. It makes more fiscal sense for a company to keep items that can be stored longer rather than fresh produce. As a result, if they want fresh produce from a different grocery store, that means more time and more money, mostly due to transportation. The wealthier parts of these cities are more likely to have grocery stores with an ample supply of fresh produce. Rural areas are a little different. Fresh produce is still an issue, but for a different reason. While those in the countryside are more likely to have a vehicle mostly out of necessity and lack of public transportation, they have to budget for the cost of fuel, not to mention the cost of car repairs and maintenance. If they go into town for groceries, this may only happen once or twice a month, which means if they get fresh produce, they need a way to store it or preserve it until that next trip. Not only that, but smaller grocers in these areas may not see it as a fiscally smart choice to have produce, and instead will opt for more frozen, canned, and processed options. This has allowed budget stores like Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, and Dollar General to get a unique foothold. When I was a kid, my dad would try to save money any way he could. So when my mother went shopping, he had one rule. No name brands. 
So instead of Fruit Loops, Cheerios, or Frosted Flakes, we got... Cereal? What is this stuff? Loops? Flakes? Is there a prize inside? The prize is you don't starve to death. As far back as 2018, the store Dollar General has been increasing locations, especially in poor areas, both rural and urban. Local grocery stores rely on profits from items in the store that have a longer shelf life, and when a company like Dollar General enters the picture and undercuts the price, it makes it harder for them to stay in business. As a result, the local grocer tends to go out of business along with the access to fresh produce. By targeting food deserts where households are already struggling with a small food budget, they exacerbate the lack of access to healthy foods. Vice News traveled to Kansas where grocery stores have been decreasing in part due to stores like Dollar General coming in and undercutting the prices. Dollar General has also been increasing in urban areas even if there are already discount stores in the same space. The residents have been fighting back, saying they don't want more discount dollar stores in their area. They already have those and don't need more, they need grocery stores with fresh produce. In Kellaway's article, quote, Some, including dollar store executives themselves, argue that a low-cost retailer seeking to go where no one else will benefits underserved communities. But Institute for Local Self-Reliance argues that dollar stores are not a true solution to hunger or food insecurity. Furthermore, the group says they do nothing to promote food sovereignty or people's right to control the production and distribution of their own food, end quote. There are some Dollar General stores that are trying to incorporate more healthy food options, but unless those options are affordable and available relatively fast, it's not alleviating the food desert issue. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Mmm, another thing, the cold, crisp taste of Coke is so satisfying, it keeps me from eating something else that might really add those pounds. Every so often, a new superfood or diet becomes the new buzzword. When I was in high school, the Atkins diet was increasing in popularity. It focused on eating more proteins and less processed carbohydrates like bread. Then there was a trend of cooking with olive oil instead of that quote-unquote unhealthy vegetable oil, the trend of acai berries that no one could pronounce. Every time this happens, the superfood undergoes a different packaging and then the price changes. Those who are poor are affected the most if it is an item that is prevalent in their diet. Foods that are common in another culture or were once considered only for the poor will suddenly be highlighted for their health benefits. Turmeric is a spice common in dishes from countries in the Middle East and South Asia. The health trend for this spice was short-lived in comparison to other foods, but this bright-colored spice that had been similar in price to other spices previously suddenly tripled in price at the grocery stores near me. They also added organic versions at an even higher price. I won't go into the organic debate here, but whether organic or not, it was still expensive until this trend faded away and the price gradually dropped. Repackaging and rebranding an existing item in this way affects accessibility and whitewashes cultural impact. Another common tactic is to just make up some pseudoscience or fake health claim. For example, structured water or hexagonal water has started making the rounds of health influencers touting unfounded claims that this type of water is somehow better for the body than the water from municipal sources that we already pay for. Aside from the fact that access to clean drinkable water in the US is far below what it should be, structured water is nonsense. Now, if there's a water advisory out, access to bottled water will be even worse because if we have to buy bottled water, it should be the supposed better water. Let me send you your free packet of Miracle Spring Water. It's absolutely free, no obligation. Take a moment to jot down the number on your screen and call now. I'll send you your Miracle Spring Water absolutely free without any obligation. Clean eating is another trend on the rise. In the 50s and 60s, when prepackaged and processed foods increased in popularity, ingredient households were seen as poorer because they had to make their food from scratch and were less likely to afford convenience foods from the store. However, now the situation has flipped. Households that have more processed foods and less produce are now seen as unhealthy and poor. This trend also encourages using less spices, which adds in layers of xenophobia and racism on top of that classism. I get food through the mail, but in a different way. Every month good housekeeping arrives in my mailbox bursting with recipes. Sometimes the most satisfying meal is the one you cook yourself. Hmm, that's very true, Marge. One night, Whiff and I came home late, and we decided not to wake Iris, and instead, we microwaved our own soup. Of course, it was a horrible mess, but Iris didn't mind cleaning it up. What about food by mail? Surely if the poor budget better, they can just do that, right? First, I'll link the budget video here. 
In the 2020 New York Times article, The Chicks in the Mail, Rural Americans Faces New Worries with Postal Crisis, mail is not guaranteed for those in rural areas. Rural mail carriers don't always get overtime, so if there is bad weather or multiple heavy packages, they're putting in extra hours and effort with little to no compensation to adjust for that. Many that live in remote areas heavily rely on the post office, such as farmers that receive chicks in the mail. When services were delayed or cut off, farmers expecting 200 chicks would find that as little as 25 were still alive upon arrival. To circumvent this, farmers drove several miles to pick up the packages at a different location, which means more time and money, of course. The same article also points out that different indigenous tribes drive as far as five hours to get their mail and medications. Again, that's extra time and money they have to put in. If you're disabled, unable to drive, or there is severe weather, you're out of luck. Due to increased threats toward male workers at the time of this article, many remote and rural post offices halted services altogether. A farmer in the article said, quote, This is an attack on the tried and true service that rural America depends on. It pulls one more piece of stability, predictability, and reliability from rural America. People don't like that, end quote. Many of these meals by mail services do not operate in these same areas either, so these residents will still have to go to a farmer's market or store for produce period. Even if it's through a private company like FedEx or UPS, these private mail companies don't service many remote areas. Instead, they will leave packages at the local post office. Many of these local post offices have very limited hours and high turnover, which adds even more time to mail delivery. UPS may say two-day delivery, but if you live in a remote area, it's more likely to be seven days or more. If the food doesn't need refrigeration, then that may not be a terrible option. But if we're trying to use meals by mail as a healthier option, the extra time needs to be factored in for fresh produce. These packages will also be going through the elements like extreme heat or cold during shipping. Space ordinarily wasted is utilized to advantage by these built-in bins for flour and sugar. Another advantage is that they eliminate canisters, which take up counter surface. Behind the door, a container holding 40 pounds of flour feeds into the smaller bin below. When the quality of convenience foods and appliances boomed in the 50s and 60s, a lot of knowledge and skills toward food storage and prep changed and some of the skills started to be forgotten. Canning your own vegetables was something that those poor people did when they couldn't afford it from the store. Growing your own food and foraging started to fall out of fashion. Why make pine cone jelly when you can buy any fruit flavor you want from the store? Honestly, do you want to be like those poor people in Appalachia using snow to make ice cream? In the description below, I've linked how food companies lie to you from Zoe B's channel to give a bit more background on the food pyramid and views on those quote white trash foods. During the recent global event in 2020, people started to try out new hobbies like baking or crochet. It also revived an interest in more self-sufficient skills such as baking bread or canning. For some, this was a way to deal with their anxiety of being at home and dealing with disruptions in the supply chain, wanting to save money, and wishing to be more self-sufficient. Canning supplies that were once cheap and easily found in thrift stores were now inflated in price and difficult to find. Canning has become a luxury hobby. Being able to buy the supplies and have the time to go through the canning process is not available for many of those at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. If you look online, the majority of the most popular influencers are usually upper middle class, female, and white. Alexis Nicole, or Black Forager, is one of the few influencers that is a person of color and has a large following where she spreads information about foraging respectfully and using resources effectively. I highly recommend following her on social media. Knowledge of local fauna and flora to survive has been lost for various reasons such as colonization, and creators such as Nicole are working to bring this back into the public sphere. By increasing food storage and preparation skills, foraging knowledge, and improving access to fresh produce, the poor can increase their self-sufficiency and health. However, when the access to these things is behind a paywall and only accessible to those cosplaying as poor people, it's no surprise that those in poverty are less likely to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. As far as homesteaders, doomsday preppers, sovereign citizens, and those living off the grid, while they have impacted the economy of food preparation and storage, their impact is layered and complex. Aside from homesteaders, most of the reason for prepping and storing food is usually political or religious, rather than purely economical and is a bit outside of what this channel focuses on. FBI, the jig is up. All right, I admit it. I am the Lindbergh baby. Wah, wah, goo goo. I miss my fly fly, da da. Are you trying to stall us? Or are you just senile? A little from column A, a little from column B. Needing to use government programs for food is usually not common in most TV shows, and if it is present, it's often negative. In Shameless, they usually don't discuss needing to get benefits unless it's part of a scam. 
While the family struggles in raising Hope, they don't make mention of food stamps really. While there is an issue with needing daycare for Hope, Jimmy is able to secure daycare for her and it isn't subsidized by any government program. In Maid, Alex does apply for help from the government, but runs into ridiculous trails of red tape, prejudice, and bureaucracy. Using food stamps, or really any government assistance, is almost a bad word. It's not seen as a way to help a household survive, and even if the family is struggling, they are rarely portrayed using available programs, much less benefiting from them. If the family uses any government aid, it's usually shameful for those that have to, or it's seen as something that people use in order to be lazy and not have to work. In my video on rags to riches, I discuss that it's actually luck, or usually illicit activities, that allow characters to be able to escape poverty. It's not because of hard work, and these stories don't make mention of using government assistance to get by. Cultural individualism and Reaganomics fed into the negativity towards programs such as SNAP and WIC. Instead of analyzing why the average household was unable to afford basic needs, the blame shifted to the poor by perpetrating stereotypes such as not using their resources wisely and poor decision making. Many government programs are created in order to address various concerns such as malnutrition, at least in theory. These programs go by different names and are targeted at different populations, but for the most part they are put in place to help those in poverty afford groceries. WIC stands for Women, Infants, and Children. It was a pilot program started in 1972 due to malnutrition among mothers and young children in poverty. A couple years later, this was spread to nearly all states and other changes were implemented, such as extending how long the program should last and which foods should be covered. The food stamp program began in the 1930s as a response to widespread poverty and nutrition due to the Great Depression and ended in the 1940s. Part of the reason for this was that a ninth of the potential military recruits in World War II were rejected due to ailments related to malnutrition. However, this was brought back in 1961, later made permanent with the Food Stamp Act of 1964. In 2008, the name was then changed to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. At the federal level, households at or below 130% of the federal poverty level qualify. However, each state and territory have jurisdiction to add further requirements. There is also the Commodity Supplemental Food Program that targets improving the health of low-income elderly that are at least 60 years of age by supplementing nutritious USDA foods. Linked below is the fact sheet of foods available under the CSFP program, such as fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grain cereal. While these programs target affordability for healthy foods, the issue is whether or not these same people have access to these items. For example, if 100% apple juice is covered, but the stores nearby only have juice drinks that are not 100% juice, they may be out of luck if that item is not covered under the program. These programs cover produce, but it does no good if the stores nearby don't stock any. Some of the programs have been updated to include food items from other cultures, but what about allergies? If a child has a milk, egg, or nut allergy, and nearby stores have limited access to alternative options, it's more difficult to meet that nutritional piece. There is a cultural stigma in conservative circles that using these programs in any way is bad, that lazy people use these programs, or that people are gaming the system to eat fancy foods. These programs were created because there was widespread malnutrition. These programs do alleviate the hunger issue, and by the 1970s, it was almost eliminated in the U.S. We have studies that show that the WIC program helped to decrease infant mortality, school-fed programs showed improved grades, and chronic conditions among the elderly, such as osteoporosis and hypertension, decreased as a result of these programs. Of course, the 1980s came with Reaganomics, and the number of food insecure households came back and in greater numbers due to widening inequality and decrease in spending in these programs. In short, we know how to fix the issue. It's just that the cultural and political hurdles need to be eliminated in order to do so. The mantra from the 40s throughout to the 70s was, where hunger goes, communism follows. While this was more of a reaction to the Red Scare, it inadvertently led to improved health outcomes. However, over time, increasing restrictions and access to these programs worsen the health of those in poverty and feeds into other aspects of life. As mentioned in the video on budgets, the poor don't have an issue with budgeting. It's lack of access to resources. By improving access to healthy foods and resources, it leads to improved outcomes for society as a whole. People are not an infinite resource, and the overly idealized individualism heavily pushed in the U.S. will hurt everyone in the long run. If more people are able to meet their basic needs, such as food, clothing, and shelter, then we can start to focus on other aspects to improve outcomes for ourselves and our neighbors. Access to affordable produce should not be a luxury. We fixed this issue before, and we can do it again. Until next time. 
Come on back and see me again for some more fun learning. And remember, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Okay? I've got to go now. So long.